The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, And do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, so have you ever heard of this word? And I'm trying to make sure I get it right. The word, aphidioba, aphidioba, oh gosh, aphidiophobia. Yeah, aphidiophobia. Have you ever heard that? Maybe it's said right, I don't know. Okay, so aphidiophobia. It's a word that describes an extreme, overwhelming fear, phobia of snakes. One place I actually saw it defined, it said it was the irrational fear of snakes. And let me tell you, there ain't nothing irrational about a fear of snakes. Those things are awful. Nothing should be able to move like that on land without legs. It's beyond natural. I always wonder what God was thinking when that invention came off the drawing board. But it could have been, they came from, you know, where it happened at the beginning of the Bible, at the beginning of Genesis. We're told, you know, when when the serpent tricks the humans, in Genesis 3, it says, The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. They've become so awful because they've been destined to eat dust all the days of their life. Well, I have plenty of reasons and examples that show my dislike for these creepy things, and I feel like I've told this story before, but it's the story of the sister who cried snake. Have you heard that one? It was my sister when I was about 10 or 11. She worked for the summer, maybe even the year, at a, at a camp and retreat center, and so my family went to visit her one weekend, And we thought, how fun it would be to go on a family hike. And so we started out on the hike, and she decided at that point she would warn us that about this time of year, occasionally on the trails, we might encounter a snake. So she proceeded about every 10 minutes to shout, snake, just to see what would happen. Apparently, she found it amusing because she kept doing it, whatever my reaction was. And... Finally, after she did it a whole bunch of times, the final time she shouted, Snake, I had had enough. I turned around and I told her to knock it off. But when I looked at her, the look on her face and the words she was trying to get out of her mouth that said, No, really? Made me turn back around and with my foot still in the air, about to take the next step, I noticed that that next step was about to be on top of a 16-foot, 80-pound, biggest snake ever in the history of the world, so it seemed, snake. My parents claimed they still have never seen anyone jump so high. I'm sure none of you who are an older sibling would ever do that to your younger sibling, would you? 
But I'm getting the impression that I'm not the only one with this kind of fear, right? A, a marketing company actually conducted a poll called What Are We Afraid Of? And it discovered that 36% of adults in the United States list snakes as their number one fear. 36%. Anyone join me? Lots of you. Yeah. So you can probably imagine that I, just like many of you, would have preferred to skip over today's Old Testament reading. Come on. God sending poisonous serpents to the people who are complaining against them, and, and these serpents kill anyone and everyone whom they bite. Well, that's not a story I want to hear or even mess with. Not just because it's a story all about snakes, but because it's a story that really makes you scratch your head. So what is going on in there, that story? So we have these Israelites who have been wandering in the desert for quite a while, almost 40 years now, 40, trying to reach their homeland, and let's say they're not really enjoying the ride, right? They're hungry, they feel like they're lost. And if you've ever ridden in a car with someone who's hungry and feels like they're lost, you know how miserable that can be. And so... Moses and God have been listening to all this complaining. They're hearing, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I got to go to the bathroom again. Can we just go back? Are we there yet? I mean, you've heard that too, right? Their let's go back to Egypt committee was in full force. Have you ever heard of that term? A let's go back to Egypt committee? I knew a pastor once who said that about every church he served has one of those committees. It's that group of people who are opposed to any sort of change. They're afraid of where they might end up. They just want to go back to where things used to be. I'm glad I've never experienced that. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So for, for years and years and miles and miles, all Moses hears is complaining and grumbling, and murmuring. People didn't like the bitter water. They complained about the lack of food. They were thirsty. They grumbled that they didn't have any meat to eat. They complained to Moses over and over again. But, like a good leader, Moses took their complaints on their behalf to God over and over again. And God would offer solutions. God would fix things. God would send manna or quails to eat. God would point to a rock where a water would suddenly gush forth. God would listen to these complaints and try to appease and comfort the wandering crowds for years. Until the people complained one more time, not only against Moses, but this time also against God. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food. There's no water. We detest this miserable few food. They're even confused about what they're complaining about. But for God, that was one step too far. And understandably, God becomes frustrated and fed up. The people that God has been pointing to Freedom and pointing them to the promised land, these people have completely and absolutely failed to trust God. And in fact, they've now gone so far as to blame God for this predicament. So since the people don't recognize or appreciate the care and the protection that God has been providing them so far, God decides to take it away. And these vipers and snakes and serpents that have been in the desert with them all along now come and encircle their feet and begin to bite the Israelites. And they begin to die. People are terrified. They don't know what to do. So again, confronted by these consequences of these decisions, they turn to Moses. Help save us, Moses. Get God to save us. So Moses does what he always does and prays to God. And it's here. It's in what God does, what God offers, 
that makes us pause and scratch our heads. God tells Moses, okay, make, make a poisonous serpent out of bronze, put it on a pole, and lift it up where everyone can see it, and, and tell the people, tell the Israelites that if they get bit by a snake, to look up, look at that metal serpent, and the snake bite won't kill them. I don't know about you, that feels like a strange promise. During the season of Lent, we've been considering some of God's promises, God's covenants to humankind, especially the covenants that we hear at the beginning of the biblical history. So over these past three weeks, we've recalled the covenant that God makes with Noah. It's that reminder of the rainbow in the sky so that never again will God wipe away life on this planet out of anger with a flood. We hear the covenant that God has made with Abram and Sarai, who have now become Abraham and Sarah, because God's promise with them is that they would become parents of a multitude of nations and generations. And then last week we pondered what these promises and covenants look like through the lens and obedience to the Ten Commandments. And now we are presented with another covenant but one that is shown by a snake on a stick. I mean, we heard in these stories, these past stories, God saved Noah and his family and all life that was on the ark. God provided a direction and a child to the barren Sarah and Abraham. God made an agreement with the Israelites for how they were supposed to live. God did all of those things for them. So, when we hear today's story, I mean, it's, the question is, couldn't God just have gotten rid of the snakes? Or at the very least, made them non-venomous? Though for me, venom or non-venom, get them out of there. I mean, God could do any of those things, but instead, God asked the people to do something. God tells the people and asks them to, again, trust God. If they do what God says, and if they look up at the serpent on a pole, God has promised them that they will live. So this promise of life is further reinforced for us, not only in this whole season of Lent, but also today in particular when we hear the gospel reading, when we hear Jesus refer to this serpent on a pole as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John's Gospel. As these two are talking, Jesus draws a parallel between the ways that Moses lifted up that serpent on a pole and how the people were saved and how the way that the Son of Man will also be lifted up and how that will bring salvation. Because for Jesus, both of those images, the serpent and the cross are reminders of the saving action of God. Again, at first this seems confusing. I mean, the serpent is the image of the very thing that's killing the Israelites. The cross, as we know in reality, is, is a device of torture and death. It's the thing that killed Jesus. But maybe that's the point of these things. For just as the snake that was lifted up on the pole showed the Israelites the thing that was killing them, maybe too the cross that's lifted up shows humans the thing that is killing us. Not the thing on the cross, not Jesus, but rather the thing itself and ourselves. The thing is pointing to what we in our sin would do and have done to another human. It's what we, in our sin, have even done to God. So these two stories, the stories of Moses' serpent on a pole and the story of the cross, these stories remind us of how far we have gotten off track. And in them, we recognize that 
Reminders of God's grace aren't always enough to fix all the things. At some point, we have to face our own sin. We have to face our own mistakes, our own brokenness. In other words, in order to be healed and brought back to life, we have to face the things that are killing us. We have to face ourselves. Hence, the season of Lent. And it's so it's there where promises and love and sin and pain all meet. It's there that we come to understand the true depth and power of God's love. It's there that we are reminded that God can take even the most lethal and deadly parts of our world and the most sinful and selfish parts of ourselves and find ways to redeem them and remake them into instruments of healing and hope. And so my prayer is that we might be able to take this time here before Easter, that we might look up to the cross and even in our deepest fear, trust in the light of God's redeeming grace. Amen.